One of the most challenging things to deal with in studying emerging markets is the issue of integration versus segmentation. In integrated capital markets, it means that local investors within the country have full and free access to international investments. And it also means that international investors have the ability to freely invest in the local market. This is what's known as financial integration. There's also a term known as economic integration. And when you're fully economically integrated, it just means that trade flows are free. However, what we really concentrate on in this course is financial integration. The opposite to integration is segmentation. It means that foreigners cannot access the market and locals cannot access the, um, the foreign markets. And it turns out the way that we think about risk changes from an integrated economy to a segmented economy. In the integrated economy, we think of risk in terms of the world. There are pervasive world risk factors. In the world of the capital asset pricing model applied to the world, we think of risk as the contribution of a company or country to the variance of a well-diversified world portfolio. We can establish betas for each individual country. And the betas measure that contribution. This is the world of integrated capital markets with a one-factor type of model. However, in segmented markets, the story is different. There is no world CAPM here. There might be a local capital asset pricing model. The local model works just like the world model, except when we estimate betas, we estimate betas versus the local market index. And the risk within this local model is the contribution to the variance of the local market portfolio. Now, for emerging markets, one thing that's real clear is that the variance of the local market return is quite high, much higher than the variance of the world market return. So it kind of makes sense in a segmented market that to get investors to bear the type of variance, the type of volatility that they experience in emerging markets, you have to offer a pretty high reward. To get those local investors in the local market to bear 40 or 50 percent volatility per year, you have to offer a high expected return. Now, what happens when the market gradually integrates into world capital markets. So suppose barriers came down. The foreign investors can now invest in this market. And they take a look to see what's happening in this market. Well, they see very high expected returns. Remember, in the segmented market, the returns had to be high. The prices had to be low, another way of saying it, to get the local investors to bear the volatility risk. Well, the foreign investors are looking at this completely differently. They don't care about the volatility of that particular market. What they care about is how this market is contributing to the volatility of the world. And the key component to that is the correlation. And we remember from our introductory uh, statistics course that you can add something with a very high variance to something with a, a lower variance and reduce the variance even further if the correlation is low. So the foreign investors see this very low correlation. They see what appears to be a very high return. That's a good deal. So they start buying, capital flows start coming in, prices go up. 
So what we usually see is a market liberalizes as, as the market opens up, that prices go up and expected returns go down. They don't need to be that high because the way that risk is viewed changes. You know, it's also true for the local investors. The local investors now can hold a diversified world portfolio if they want. They, no, they don't just need to hold the securities of the companies in their country. So integration usually brings higher prices and lower expected returns. And in the big scheme of things, this is indeed important because if the required rate of return was 30% in the segmented market, there's a lot of investment projects, like direct investment projects, that are not undertaken. However, when the market integrates, expected returns decrease, hurdle rates decrease. And all of a sudden, all these projects that were promising an internal rate of return of 20% start looking good. There's more investment. There's more employment. There's more opportunity for the economy. Now, you know, before closing this, uh, this, we have to really talk about um, some of the costs of integration too. And there's certainly a lot of discussion about what it means in terms of economic stability. That if there's a problem, equity, foreign equity can leave very quickly and potentially could be very disruptive to the market. And I guess the way that I view this is the following. If you integrate, then the result should be a lowering of the overall cost of capital. This will increase investment, this will introduce potential growth opportunities, this will increase average real GDP growth. Is it without cost? No. It is possible that there's extra volatility that's induced here. But it's a matter of a policy trade-off. Do you want slower growth and more stability or higher growth and potentially some instability. Indeed, it's the same thing as the portfolio choice problem that we studied in our most uh, basic finance course. You map out the efficient frontier. Some investors are going to choose a portfolio that has low volatility and lower expected return, and other investors are going to choose a portfolio with higher volatility and higher expected return. It's really the investor's choice based upon their preferences. And indeed, I think it's really the same thing here when we apply this to a country. It's a policy preference. You want lower expected return and lower volatility? Or do you want higher expected return and higher volatility? Now, I don't think it's right to say that one is correct and one is incorrect. It's just a matter of policy. Because what we do is to try to understand the implications and to use that to develop models to help us assess investment projects, cost of capital models.